If we haven't met before, my name is Ashley, and I'm the lead pastor here at Hope, and I want to welcome you on behalf of all of our teams. We are so pumped. It's a new month, and it's a brand new series. God is doing new things. I want to thank our props and our programming teams. Love our creative teams. Love the stage set that they created last Sunday. Come on. We believe church should be enjoyed, never endured, and we love to have fun. We love to do fresh and relevant things. And we are taking our lives to the next level with our brand new series today. It's called Next Level You. Every next level of your life, it demands a next level you. And you might be starting a new season today. Maybe you're pregnant and going to have some more kids. Maybe you're getting married. Maybe you're ent entering an empty nest season. Maybe you're getting ready to graduate high school. Maybe you are getting a promotion. You're in a new chapter. Maybe you have new challenges or new successes. We need fresh grace and fresh power from God. We need fresh strength and a next level understanding of who we are because of Jesus at every level in our lives. I've been following Jesus for 20 years and there's always so many new things to discover about who he is. He never changes, but man, my understanding of him, it's always growing, it's always changing, and I'm always getting to know him differently. Come on. And who we are at each level in our lives, it looks different for us too. It's different than who we were at the last level as we become more of ourselves. Not a different you, but the you that's always been there. The you that God formed in your mom's womb. The you that he had plans for from before the foundation of the earth. The real you. I was reading this week about lobsters. And lobsters, they're delicious. My favorite food, by the way. Anybody else? Lobsters, they outgrow their shells. They start to grow and they get uncomfortable. So they molt their shells. And they grow a new shell. And every shell, I read, looks completely different than the last shell. But the potential for that shell was always inside them. It was always in their DNA. And like, likewise, each season in our lives requires us to tap in parts of us that maybe look different from what we're used to, but the things that have always been there and are waiting to be unlocked. So excited for this series. So we are three-part beings. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. You are a spirit who has a soul and you live in a body. You're born with a spirit that's dormant. And your soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions, your soul and your body are in the driver's seat. So little babies, they are driven by their emotions, crying all the time, hungry, you know, driven by their body, driven by needs. When we're babies, we're like, feed me, comfort me. That's mine. We're me focused. But we are so much more than our body and our soul. God put eternity in our hearts, and we long for more. And we go through life searching for that more that's in there, searching for our identity, searching for our purpose. When I was in high school, they kind of want you to decide what career you want for the rest of your life. And as I'm thinking about, oh my gosh, you know, my life is in front of me. There's so many possibilities. Here I am, like 15. What do I want to do for the next 50 or 60 or 70 years? And I got thinking, okay, I want to have a family. That'd be great. And then my family, you know, my kids will grow up one day and move out of the house. And then what, you know? Well, I want to have a career. Well, and then one day you retire from your career. And then what? What do we do with our lives that matters? And I started searching for answers. And back in those days, in the early 2000s, the Gideons gave out Bibles at schools. I don't think they still do that. Um, but I got a Bible, and I started reading it. And I was like, this is what I've been searching for. And there was a prayer in the back of the Bible that said, read this if you want to trust in Jesus. So I prayed the little prayer. And my spirit woke up to what I had been searching for. And I don't know what your story is. Maybe like me, you were searching for something, or maybe you were searching for something with your identity. Maybe you were searching for something in a job. Maybe you were searching for something in a relationship, and Jesus got a hold of your life. Or maybe you come here today, and you're still searching 
Man, we want to help you discover how to wake up your spirit today to what you've always longed for. The moment that you believe in Jesus, your spirit wakes up to new life. When we believe in Jesus, we become a new creation. We believe and then we become. The old is gone and the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, When someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He's not the same anymore. A new life has begun. We are made new when we trust in Jesus. Not us improved. Not us 2.0. Not us cleaned up. Brand new. With a woke up spirit. It's kind of like when you get a new car. There's a new car smell. It's got shiny leather. It's new versus a used car. My first car was a Nissan Sentra, 1988 standard car. And it smelled like hay. I don't know where the people kept it. I think it was probably in a barn. My first car smelled like hay. And I had to clean it up because it was used. Jesus paid for the brand new version of us. He changed us from old to new. And we didn't have to clean ourselves up. He changed us on the inside. And what we believe determines who we become. You treat a new car differently than an old car. You value it differently. It's so important for you to know that you are made new when you trust in Jesus. When our family's car was new to us, we didn't let our kids eat in it. You know, we didn't want to get crumbs on anything. Well, now that it's like old to us, they eat in it all the time. In fact, around Christmas, my daughter had a cup of eggnog in the car. I don't know why I let her bring eggnog in the car, but she fell asleep holding the eggnog like this. And when she woke up, she said, something happened to my eggnog. Someone spilled it everywhere. I said, yes, that did happen. When it's old, you treat it differently. What you believe about yourself determines how you treat yourself and how you treat other people. When you believe what God says about you, you live differently. The old is gone, the new has come. When you believe lies about yourself, you live in less than what you were created for. If you believe that you're lazy, you're like, bring on the Netflix and chips, this is what I deserve. But if you believe you have a purpose, you'll naturally discipline your time, you'll plan in your workout or your books, or your experiences because you believe there is something that matters about you. When you believe you're not worthy of love, you'll settle for relationships that you would never settle for if you knew who you really are. But when you believe that you're loved by God, you'll operate out of a place of security. You won't look for approval, but you will know, I am already approved. You'll have confidence. Come on. When we see God clearly, we start to see ourselves clearly. The Bible says before we believe in Jesus, there's a veil that covers our minds, a veil, something that stops us from seeing all the way. So we can't understand the truth of who God is. Some of us think, oh, he's mad at me, or he wants to punish me, he's ashamed of me, or he's boring or limiting, or he wants me to earn his love. He wants me to be a cookie cutter. Nothing could be further from the truth. He pursues us to love us. He's the most fun, creative, and comforting being in existence, and he made us unique. He loves our differences. The more you discover about who God is, the more you discover about yourself, because he's your creator. When you believe in Jesus, that veil is removed, the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 3, 16. Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When Jesus died, he tore the veil. He gave us direct access to God so that all we have to do is believe in him. Verse 17, for the Lord is the spirit and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So just like we have three parts, God has three parts. He's a three-part being. God the Father, the Son Jesus, and his Holy Spirit. And his spirit fills our spirit when he wakes us up. So he's three parts, we're three parts. And his spirit gives us freedom. 
Freedom, wherever the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom from condemnation, freedom from shame, freedom from bondage. There's forgiveness for our history, for the past choices that we made. There's healing for our hurts, for the things that other people did to us. There's freedom from the habits that are still holding us back from our next level life. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. When His Spirit connects to your spirit, there is freedom. Verse 18, all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we're changed into His glorious image. When we believe in Jesus, that veil is removed, and we can see God clearly. We see that He's good. We see that He loves us, that He has good plans for us, that He wants to give us an abundant life, that He wants to see us tap into everything that He created us to be. When we believe, His Spirit working in us makes us become more and more like Him. It helps us to become. We see Him, and then we reflect Him when that veil is removed. Another translation says, we see as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So it's like we're looking in a mirror. We see Him clearly. And we are transformed into that same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of God. So we're made new, and then we're being transformed to look more like Jesus. When you believe in Jesus, he makes you new inside. And then his spirit works in you to help transform you into who you really are. Point one today, when you believe, God helps you become. When you believe, God helps you become. We do the believing part, and God does the transforming part. As we yield to him, as we believe in him more, he changes us from the inside out. The old is gone. The new has come. The new you. The next level you. There was a man who lived in extreme poverty, and he was homeless for a lot of his life. When he died, his family came and actually cleaned out his apartment. He had a little one-room apartment, and um, they cleaned it out, and they found this painting, which they sold at a yard sale. And the person who got the painting got it appraised, and it appraised for $3 million. This guy had lived his whole life in poverty, and he had this treasure that he had no idea he had. He had everything he needed to thrive, but he didn't know it. And if you don't understand who you are because of Jesus, you will live in spiritual poverty. If you don't understand your value, you'll go around thinking, I'm average, and you'll never aspire to who God made you to be. And even though you're full of potential, you'll never tap into it if you don't believe it. If you don't believe it, you can't see it, and you can't become it. You do the believing part, and as you yield to the Spirit, God does the transforming. He does the setting free. We believe. Ephesians 2.8 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. Salvation is a free gift from God. It's not a reward. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. We can't take credit for it. No more than we can take credit for a gift anyone else gives us. We receive it by believing. And belief has action. Sometimes it looks like obeying what God's asking you to do. It looks like taking a step. It looks like responding to God in faith. It looks like operating out of our belief. In the Bible, God asked Abraham to leave his family and go to the land that he had promised him. Abraham believed God, and then he also had action to his belief. When you know who you are, when you know God, he helps you to know what to do. Verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are God's masterpiece. Awake to who we are because of Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us when he created us. Point two today is you are God's masterpiece. And that's the title of today's message, Masterpiece. Each week of this series, we're going to talk about one more aspect of who we are when we believe in Jesus. You are a masterpiece. 
And I know it's weird. We don't often say that. We don't walk around like, I'm a masterpiece. But it's true. God says it about you. He said it. I believe it. You're a masterpiece. Come on. Tell the person next to you, you're a masterpiece. Now tell your friend on the other side so they don't think you're ignoring them. You're a masterpiece. Now say it about yourself. I'm a masterpiece. Oh, you guys sound like you believe it today. I love it, 9 a.m. Come on. As you believe it, you'll become it. And God helps you to become it. You're a masterpiece. You're an original, one of a kind. There's never been and there will never be another you. The way you look, the things you love about your body, and the things that you don't, God sees them as a masterpiece. He created them on purpose. He knows everything about you. He knows every single hair on your head. Your skin color, he loves it. Those freckles, he thinks they're adorable. Your height, it's exactly the way that he designed it. Your eyes, perfect in every way. He went to great lengths to make you exactly who he wanted you to be. And you're created in his image. That's exciting. In the image of God, we're created. We look like him. And when the veil's taken away, we can see that image better. And we begin to reflect that image. And maybe at first, that reflection's like a carnival mirror where it's a little bit like stretched out and, you know, hard to recognize. But the more that you get to know Jesus and the more you let his spirit work in you, the more you become like him and the, the more your reflection looks like him. We are being transformed to be more like Jesus by his spirit in us and our spirit that's running after God. We do that by renewing our mind. We replace past beliefs with what God says about us now. Where we believed one thing that you know, we thought was true, we, we t take it and compare it to God's word and we're like, oh, that's what God says about me. Okay. Or we do it by changing our will. It's from being focused on us, God changes us so that we're focused on him. We're focused on other people. We're not like those babies anymore, me, 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 me. We're like, no, we care about other people because God cares about us. And we process our emotions with faith. Our personalities are a reflection of God. Do you know there's only a certain number of personalities in the world? This blows my mind. Like whether you do Enneagram personalities or DISC or color personalities, there's always a finite amount of personalities because they all reflect different aspects of God's character. On our teams, we use color personalities, and there are four of those. You can be any two of these colors. Uh, we've got fun-loving, life of the party, blues. Come on, blues. <laughs> we've got analytical, strategizing, greens. I'm a green. We got compassionate, encouraging, yellows. Care about people so well, yeah. And goal-oriented, charge ahead, reds. And when the veil is removed, we see God better, and we see ourselves more clearly because he's our creator, and we reflect different expressions of who he is. And those differences are good. Come on, he wants us to reflect them. He wants us to represent him. He wants us to be different and unique. And we're going to be talking about that more next week. But right now, let's look at Matthew 5, 14. You are here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God's not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. A city on a hill, you can see that from very far away. And God, man, people want to see him from very far away. He wants to show us off. We're lights. We're here to be lights. That's what Jesus said. And what do lights do? They just shine. They reveal the beauty of God in the world around them. They bring out the God colors. Verse 15, if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Come on, Jesus says, I am putting you on display. I'm not going to hide you. You're a masterpiece. When you have a masterpiece, you put it on display. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Come on, masterpieces are on display so the creator gets the glory. God shows us off to show who he is. Think about the Mona Lisa. It's on display for the world to see. And what does it do? 
reflect Da Vinci. Whenever my kids make me pictures, I put them on display, not because they're awesome, but because they created them. My son made me a picture last week, and I was really proud of him because usually his pictures are like scribbles. He's four, so he's still learning. But this one was actually a sunshine, and I think we have it for you. We'll put it up on the screen. Yep. That's his first real picture. So proud. I'm putting it on display right now. He's got a sunshine, and below that is our house, in case you didn't know, that's a house. And then the green stuff is trees. And then, do you see that brown thing in the bottom right corner? He said, Mom, that's poop. <laughs> yeah, he painted poop into my picture. He's a four-year-old boy. And you know what? I, I'm still proud of his picture. I love this picture. Did I still put it on display? Absolutely. I didn't put it on display because it was perfect, but because of who made it. And maybe you're discounting yourself because you're not perfect and you've made mistakes or you have shortcomings like we all do. Your value doesn't come from your performance. That's religion and it doesn't help anyone. Your worth comes from your relationship with Jesus. Come on. Relationship is what changes things. If your child makes me a picture with poop painted on it, I'm not going to put it on display. Your kids are really cute, but I have a different relationship with them than I do with my kids. Even if they make me something awesome, I'm probably not going to put it on my fridge because we have a different relationship. Your relationship with Jesus is what makes him want to put you on display. Not what you do, who you are. And you are a masterpiece created to shine. Come on. You are a masterpiece, and God's works are wonderful. Come on. He is shaping you. He's transforming you into his image day by day. You're made new, and your creator isn't done with you yet. One of the ways the enemy steals from us is by getting us to believe a lie that something about us is not good, that we need to be like someone else, or reminding us of everything that we're not. If we're the Mona Lisa, he's like, oh, you need to be like the statue of David. We can't compare those. David's a statue. Mona Lisa's a painting. David's naked. Mona Lisa's got clothes on. <laughs> They're not the same thing, guy, girl. Don't compare them. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't criticize what God has created. You're a masterpiece right now. It doesn't say you will be a masterpiece someday when you're good enough. No. You are a masterpiece right now, right where you're at. Come on. It's not enough to know that God says it about you. You have to believe it and receive it. Then you become it. Accept who you are. If God says you're a masterpiece, you can believe it. Celebrate who you are. Approve yourself. You're not an accident. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're valuable. You're worthy. You're beautiful. Get up each day and say, good morning, I'm a masterpiece. Come on, write it on your bathroom mirror with a dry erase marker so you see you are a masterpiece. Speak it over your kids. Speak it over your family. You're a masterpiece. Ryder came to me a couple months ago and he was showing me his ear. He's like, mom, quick, there's a problem with my ear. I'm like, oh, show me what's going on. Do you have like a boo-boo? And he's like, there's a cliff on my ear. I looked at his ear, and he does have a little bump from where he was born, and it looks like he has a pierced ear. In fact, when we took him to the pediatrician, like his first appointment, they're like, did you pierce your baby's ear? He's like a week old. Like, no, that's just the way he was created. And I told Ryder, that is where God put you together. God made you special. And he went to his sister, he said, check it out. This is where God made me. He was so proud of it. I want to say to you, be proud of how God made you. When you accept who you are, then you can reflect his glory. Then you can reflect who he is. You're a masterpiece with a purpose. Knowing and accepting who you are makes you self-aware. But if you're self-aware and you have no purpose, man, that's the worst. You're a masterpiece 
made new by Jesus to do the good things that he planned for you. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 9 and 10 again. It says, Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece, created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Salvation isn't a reward for the good things that we've done. But when we're made new by Jesus, we get to do good things that he's planned for us. We're not saved by good things, but for good things. And that's the opposite of religion. Religion says do good and be saved. But Jesus says because you're saved, because you're set free, use your freedom to do good. He gives us identity. We're a masterpiece. And then he gives us purpose. Come on. We get to do good things. Whenever my family goes on vacation, I love to plan everything we're doing. I love to plan restaurants. I love to plan activities. I'm like, oh my goodness, they would love this thing on our trip. And I imagine that's how God is with us, planning good things for us. Like, she would love this. He would love that. I have good things for them to do. We get to do exciting, rich, and meaningful things that he's prepared for us. And we bring him glory through the good things he's planned. Third point today, God created you to reflect his glory. He created you to reflect his glory. And we've already seen it in a couple verses today. Let your light shine to glorify your Father in heaven. 2 Corinthians, see and reflect his glory. What does that mean? What does it mean to reflect his glory? To bring him glory, to glorify him. It means to honor God, to value him for who he really is to celebrate him, to magnify him, to praise him, to give him weight in our lives. I saw a poster this week, and it's um, this teeter-totter, and there's a butterfly on the bottom of it, and it's so tiny, and then there's an elephant at the top of it, and it says, you know, excuses are at the top, and dreams are at the bottom. The butterfly represents the dreams, and the butterfly carried weight that holds up the excuses. And I love that when we think about God. God is the weight. We give him weight in our lives. And everything else responds to him. And no matter where you're at today, whether you're a doctor, you're a teacher, a parent, a grandparent, whether you're single or married, wherever you're at, you can bring God glory in everything that you do at home, at work, at school, at church, everything. Do it with your whole heart as unto him. We bring him glory through the good things he's planned for our lives. Your gifts, your talents, your skills, your dreams, your personality, all the things he's given you, they're in you to bring him glory. He knew you before you were born, and he put you right where he wanted you, in this moment in history, in Corning, New York, to reflect his glory in everything. And that's not a pressurey thing, like, Oh, there's so much, you know, responsibility in that. No, no, no. It's a freeing thing. We get to do that. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Freedom to do what he planned for us to do. And for some of us, that means letting go of what we're not. Maybe you've been focusing on the things you can't do. You can't sing. You're not good at making repairs. You're not interested in your family's business. If you don't have it, you might not need it for your purpose. Focus on what you can do. We call that a can-do attitude here at Hope. It's an attitude that we choose to say we focus on what we can do and why it will work and not what we can't do and why it won't work. Don't hold on to something that you're not, something that you thought you should be. Run after who God says that you are. There's only one you. If you don't you do you, no one else is going to. He'll give you everything you need to be everything he called you to be. 2 Peter 1.3 says, By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Everything. We've received all of this by coming to know him. You see that? We receive by knowing him. The one who called him to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. God's given us everything we need for life. Everything you need When you know Jesus, God gives it to you. And there might be things you think you need 
You don't really need them. God gives you what you need. And if it's something that you aren't yet, but it's something you need to be, to be who he made you to be, then he'll help you become it. His spirit's working in you. He's transforming you. There are some things within you that you might not have tapped into yet because you have a need of them. When you step out at your next level in faith, he'll develop things in you that you didn't need at your last level. And there are some things that just take time that you'll choose to grow in. And even though you're not perfect at them yet, you can put in the work to develop them and partner with him as you become those things. You didn't need the skills to be a husband until you became one. You didn't need the skills to be a mom until you became one. Or a CEO at work until you became it. But he was developing those things in you before you needed them, before you got to where you're at today. And he's developing things in you right now that you will need in your next level. And you're still developing. I'm not gonna be the same communicator next year that I am now. I'm in process and so are you. Come on, he's developing things in us. And we obey him, we take steps of faith. We say, yes, God, use us. We wanna glorify you. Don't settle for this level of you. Get excited about the new you at the next level. You can't even imagine what God has prepared for you long ago, come on. He's working out everything for your good and for his glory right now. Here's our last verse today, James 1, 2. Brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. You can get excited when troubles come because they're opportunities for you to grow. Whenever bad things happen, I literally get excited. And it seems like to other people, that is not right. There's something wrong with her. But I get excited because I know God's going to take that hard thing and he's going to use it to produce good things, good things that wouldn't happen without it. Every hard thing that's happened in my life has been worth it. Job losses, sickness, death, people leaving our lives. I wouldn't change any of those things because I wouldn't be who I'm supposed to be. All those worst things, God turns them into the best things when you have a relationship with him. Come on. And that relationship, we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's a relationship that we receive by faith, by believing in Jesus and believing what he says about us and replacing what we thought we knew about us and him with what he says. The more we learn his truth, the more we get set free from the things that have held us back. The more we allow his spirit to work within us, the more we surrender to him. He's counseling us, he's convincing us of who we are in Jesus. When we do that, we unlock who we really are. And we experience that next level of who God created us to be. When you believe, God helps you become. You are a masterpiece created anew in Jesus to do the good things God planned for you long ago.